This is, this is very encouraging. Thank you very much. Because in meeting this audience today, I feel like a businessman facing an assembly of his creditors. Creditors whom he had successfully jollied along by his promises for some time. But who have at last turned around determined to present all their claims for immediate payment. Realizing this situation, I shall naturally start with the plea for a reasonable settlement. Let me tell you then how I regard my task for tonight. I have spoken of the two great ideas launched by the French Revolution. One was embodied in the twin movement of scientism and romanticism, of the liberation of the intellect and of man's individuality. The other was a new tide of social hopes containing varying proportions of nationalism. I have said that these two ideals, or more precisely, two clusters of ideals, are in essential conflict with each other, and that this conflict has been catastrophically resolved in modern totalitarianism by uniting them in a way which mutually satisfies and destroys them. But I have added that this solution has in turn proved unstable. I have suggested that the predominant trend of modern thought today, both inside the Soviet Empire and outside it, is an urge to escape from the precarious and eventually disastrous solutions presented by modern nihilism and totalitarianism. But this urge to escape is today a disorderly route. It is our task to shape it into a coherent movement. For it is in vain that some former communists once more discover their patriotism or else seek refuge in the church or try to relapse into political indifference. Nor will they find satisfaction in jazz or in the monastic muteness of the beatniks. Having broken out of prison, they will, of course, be happy to find any place where they can settle down freely. But we must not be deceived by these immediate reactions they can offer only temporary alleviation. Revisionism cannot succeed permanently by merely returning to ideals or to distractions, the instability of which had originally caused the modern mind to descend into disaster. No, we must realize the difficulties of the modern condition to the full and accept the tremendous task of revising the ideals of the French Revolution so that they be purged of their faithful internal contradictions. I have tried to make a beginning in this direction by revising two aspects of scientific rationalism. I first showed that all our knowledge is rooted in a tacit awareness of things to which we are not attending at the time and which we may never be able to identify at all. And I rejected on these grounds the ideal of a knowledge explicitly stating clear and distinct ideas. My acknowledgement that all knowing is rooted in tacit awareness led on to the realization that all knowledge whether tacit or explicit, is accepted by us as an aspect of a hidden reality and that if what we believe to be true is in fact true, the reality that we have touched upon may be expected to reveal itself in an indeterminate range of yet hidden manifestations. 
This was, this was my first step in the vindication of reality, of that never fully explorable domain, the conception of which was eliminated by the ideal which would limit knowledge to explicit statements about tangible objects. Having thus got my foot in the door, I opened it wide in my last lecture and have shown you there a stratified universe in which each successive higher level of reality was rooted in lower ones. This relationship is essentially unsymmetrical. No higher level can be specified in terms of a lower one. On the other hand, higher levels can operate only within the medium of lower ones, and this imposes limitations on the range of their operation. It may involve them in being tainted and eventually frustrated. I think that this sketch shows already that such a structure of our universe might prevent the mortal clash between the two great ideals of the French Revolution. Any attempt by science to explain the nature and functioning of a comprehensive entity in terms of its particulars would be barred on logical grounds. And any attempt to reduce higher principles, for example morality, to a mere satisfaction of man's appetites would be likewise barred. And what is more, while the critical destruction of our ideals would be checked, these ideals, so fervently spread by the French Revolution, would be logically barred also from the danger of perfectionism. My analysis of what I called moral inversion in my first lecture has already pointed by implication to the menace of perfectionism. But this is the first time that I have explicitly named this danger. Let me elaborate on it for a moment. Logically, the destruction of reality of which I spoke follows from the principle of explaining everything in terms of its more tangible particulars. But the motive to carry out this logical step in real life, to reduce the universe to absurdity, to reduce man to a bundle of appetites and politics to implacable violence, the motive of this self-abomination of man lies in moral perfectionism. Admittedly, some of the great minds who contributed to this reduction of man were merely didactic, others sardonic, but the most effective of them were those driven by fury. When Baudelaire, a century ago, prefaced the volumes of his great poems by addressing his public as hypocritical reader, my equal, my brother, he gave went both to his fury and to this self-abasement. Such is the reaction of the modern mind to the spectacle of a society professing high ideals but falling far short of them in its own actions. Such the intellectual temper which in the name of a severe intellectual honesty denies reality to all that is noble in man. I could refute the demands of this perfectionism simply by referring to the logic by which successive le levels of reality are related to each other. For I have shown that the principles of any higher entity must rely for their realization on a lower level of reality and that this necessarily limits the effectiveness of all higher principles. That we can uphold, indeed, the conception of man's moral responsibility only by accepting the fact that it is necessarily tainted by the very medium which alone can bring it into action. 
that this will be only half of my answer and I shall come to it only towards the end of this lecture. Meanwhile, let me recall from my last talk that the conception of responsible human action arises within the relation of the human mind to the firmament of thought from which we receive guidance. This is a limitation of our self-determination from a level above, not below ourselves. It in, the, in the main, I shall deal tonight with this relationship. It will appear that the level above us, like that below us, enables us responsibly to determine ourselves, but that it also sets its own kind of limits to our self-determination. The necessity to limit national self-determination by submitting to tradition was passionately asserted by Edmund Burke by denouncing the French Revolution's sudden attempt to refashion from first principles all the institutions of a great nation. In reply to this, Tom Paine vigorously proclaimed the right of absolute self-determination for every generation. Innumerable pages have been written about this discussion and its sequel. The issue has been revived in America in recent years by a new defense of Burke, though I believe the teachings of Tom Paine had previously been predominant in this country. However, I do not wish to intervene in the American controversy but I think I can sum up briefly what the situation has been in England during the last 170 years. The most influential political writers, from Bentham to John Stuart Mill, and more recently Isaiah Berlin, are utilitarians. For them, liberty consists in doing what one likes, provided one does not interfere with other people's liberty to do likewise. In this view, there is obviously nothing, either in theory or in law, to restrict the English nation as a whole in doing with itself whatever it likes. Burke's vision of a, I quote, of a partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born, this vision may never have been heard of by these writers. Yet in practice, in actual practice, it is Burke's vision that controls the actions of the British nation. We can well understand this paradoxical treatment of the controversy between Tom Paine and Edmund Burke in England. The modern mind was born in an attack on traditional authority. The very idea of progress, and still more, the unlimited demands proclaimed by the French Revolution are in principle hostile to tradition. It is of the essence of modern rationalism that we must know explicitly what it is that we believe and on what grounds we believe it, and that each of us has the right and indeed the duty to check these grounds and come to our own conclusions irrespective of what others have believed in the past. Within this framework, Burke's defense of prejudice, even if the term is used neutrally as signifying prejudgment, has simply no leg to stand on. We have today no theory of knowledge compatible with scientific rationalism for accepting any tradition whatever. But the English are profoundly traditionalist. So the English solution was to save rationalism in theory while limiting its consequences by adhering to tradition in practice. Let the voice be Esau's, but the hand be Jacob's. It is clear that to acknowledge tacit thought as an indispensable element of all knowing and as the ultimate mental power by which all explicit knowledge is endowed with meaning offers a theoretical support for traditionalism. 
For if we know a great deal that we cannot tell, and if even that which we know and can tell is accepted by us as true only in view of its bearing on a reality beyond it, a reality which can yet manifest itself in the future in an indeterminate range of unsuspected ways. If indeed a thing that we know is the more real, the wider the range of its unspecifiable manifestations, then the idea of knowledge based on wholly identifiable grounds collapses, and we must conclude instead that the more a thing is worth knowing, the less we can tell what it is and how we know it. The transmission of knowledge from one generation to the other must therefore be predominantly tacit. To see how this actually goes on, we have only to remember the story of the psychiatrist who told his class, you have seen an epileptic seizure. I cannot tell you how to recognize it, but you will learn this by more extensive experience. I quoted that in my first lecture. Or was it the second? I forget. What he meant was, of course, that they would learn it from more experience of such cases identified by competent teachers. It is by accepting and closely watching a series of such authoritatively diagnosed cases that the unspecifiable characteristics of an epileptic seizure will finally dawn upon the student and the art of identifying it will be transmitted to him. This is, of course, the process of instruction in all practical classes but it applies essentially also to the teaching of theory. No teacher will be satisfied with imparting a mathematical proof as a chain of formulae connected by formal operations, and no student of mathematics should be satisfied with merely memorizing such a sequence. This would be, as Poincaré has said, like recording a game of chess while noting only that each step obeys the rules of chess. The least that is required is a grasp of the logical sequence as a purposeful procedure, what Poincaré describes as the something which constitutes the unity of the demonstration. To convey that unspecifiable coherence, which is the meaning of the mathematical proof, is a task similar to that of teaching the characteristic image of a disease. To the extent to which any knowledge that is to be communicated is tacit, it is based on dwelling in our awareness of its particulars in terms of that which we know. And it is this indwelling, this special way of being aware of the particulars that the teacher must transmit to the pupil. He can do this only if the, pupil, if the pupil will try to share this indwelling. In trying this, the pupil must take it on trust that a teaching which means nothing to him at the moment has in fact a hidden meaning, which he can discover by making an effort of indwelling, an effort of the same kind as the seeking of a solution to a problem. The whole intellectual being, the whole intellectual life of man comes into existence in this very manner by absorbing the meaning of language. The amazing deployment of the infant mind is stirred on by a veritable blaze of confidence surmising the hidden meaning of speech and of other adult behavior so as eventually to grasp their meaning. And this continues to be true of every subsequent stage of learning. It can be achieved only by trusting oneself to a considerable extent to a teacher or leader. St. Augustine has observed this when, basing himself on scripture, he said, unless ye believe, ye shall not understand. It appears then that traditionalism which requires us to believe before we know, and in order that we may know, is based on a deeper insight into the nature of knowledge 
and of the communication of knowledge than is a scientific rationalism which would permit us to believe only in explicit statements based on data and derived by modes of inference which we have previously tested. But I am not reasserting traditionalism here for the purpose of supporting dogmatism. To argue, as I do, that confidence in authority is indispensable for the transmission of human culture is not to demand submission to the authority of any particular church. I admit that my reaffirmation of traditionalism might have a bearing on religious beliefs, and I would even add that it does strengthen my own religious beliefs. But I want to set this aside here, for I believe that our ideas of critically established truth and of unlimited social improvement must be reconciled primarily on secular grounds. I should hope to derive religious enlightenment and the religious renewal from this reconciliation rather than invoke the authority of revealed religion for achieving it. I shall accept, therefore, the dynamism of the French Revolution both in its intellectual and in its social aspirations and shall try to show that such a self-determination can be saved from destroying itself only by recognizing its own limits in an authoritative traditional framework which upholds it. I shall concentrate first on one segment of modern intellectual endeavor, which will then serve as an example for outlining this aspect of all intellectual and moral progress in a dynamic society. An example will be the pursuit of natural science. This may take you by surprise, for modern science was founded by the violent rejection of authority. We are all familiar with the struggle of the Copernicans with the authority of Aristotle upheld by the Roman Church. We know how Vesalius set free the study of human anatomy from the fetters imposed on it by the authority of Galenus. Throughout the formative centuries of modern science, the rejection of authority was its battle cry. It was sounded by Bacon, by Descartes, and collectively by the founders of the Royal Society of London. These great men were clearly saying something that was profoundly true and important, but we should take into account today the sense in which they have meant it. Once the adversaries whom they fought had been defeated, a, repu a repudiation of all authority or tradition, which had actually aimed only at these adversaries, lost its original meaning and became a fallacious slogan. The popular conception of science teaches, of course, that science is a collection of experimental or observational facts which anybody can verify for himself. We have already seen that this is not true in case of expert knowledge, as in diagnosing a disease. You don't ask the first man you meet in the street to identify by the aid of a medical textbook an ailment that has befallen you. In fact, you may travel hundreds of miles to find somebody whom you may trust to do so. But this is true in its own way, also in the physical sciences. In the first place, you cannot get hold of the equipment required for testing a statement of astronomy or chemistry. And assuming, for the sake of argument, that you could get use of an observatory or a chemical laboratory, the chances are that you would damage their instruments beyond repair before you had ever made an observation. And finally, if against all reasonable expectation you would succeed in carrying out an observation to check upon the statement in question, and you then found the result which contradicted it, you would, quite rightly, consider it extremely probable that you have been mistaken. If words are to mean what they say, then it is certainly untrue 
that science is composed of the results of experiments and observations which anybody can repeat and verify for himself. The acceptance of science turns out to be based on authority. But this, conclusions, this conclusion means little unless we sketch out further, however briefly, the range of judgments controlled by this authority. The fact, the fact that the statement is true does not by itself qualify it to form part of science. For one thing, there's an infinite number of statements that are true but are of merely ephemeral interest. There are many true statements also which, though important, belong to branches of knowledge other than science. In fact, apart from its trueness, a statement is deemed to form a substantial part of science in the light of three rival, three rival criteria. They are, first, accuracy, second, relevance to the system of science, and thirdly, the ordinary non-scientific interest of the subject. Now then, this can compensate for each other as follows. Substantial scientific value, value is compounded of these three variables in different proportions. Inanimate matter, which is the subject of physics, is much less interesting in itself than living beings. In fact, it's awfully dull in itself. But physics makes up for this by the accuracy of its measurements and the beauty of its theories. On the other hand, the discoveries of biology, for example, Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood, derive their scientific importance predominantly from that which is lacking in physics, namely the general human interest of their subject. The body of scientific knowledge is what it is only by virtue of the fact that scientific authority is constantly engaged in eliminating contributions offered to science which lack an acceptable scientific value as measured by the compounded coefficients of accuracy, systematic interest, and the lay interest of their subject matter. The body of science is shaped by these complex value judgments of scientific authority. This shows that in granting authority to science, we are granting it confidence of the same kind as that a pupil must have in his teacher if he is to gain from him any knowledge based on the tacit awareness of particulars. It also tends to show that the progress of science could not be pursued but for the fact that it is controlled and to this extent restricted by an authority which must be implicitly trusted in doing so. But I must go a little further if I am to illustrate, illustrate how, within the pursuit of science, the fateful conflict between the upholding of our unlimited critical powers and the acceptance of any authority over them is, in fact, resolved. Well, I'll give you a story. A few years ago, there appeared in the British scientific journal called Nature a table of figures showing with fair accuracy that the time of gestation measured in days of a number of different animals, ranging from rabbits to cows, is a multiple of the number pi. <laughs> well, the agreement was striking, yet the communication was shrugged aside as a joke. For no amount of evidence would convince a modern scientist that there is any relation with the period, between the period of gestation of animals and multiples of the number pi. This is an example of the way in which scientific authority keeps rejecting conclusions which otherwise would seem justified by the evidence if they are in conflict with the accepted view of the nature of things. I could give you any number of instances in which this authority is exercised in this sense and which I regard as justified, indeed as indispensable for the advancement of science. 
But in other cases, I am doubtful about the exercise of such authority. I think it is possible that the study of extrasensory perception has been excessively discouraged by scientific authority. I am doubtful about a teaching usually ascribed as, described as Lloyd Morgan's canon, which I have seen quoted many times, I have never seen challenged since its enunciation in 1894. I quote its words. In no case may we interpret an action as the outcome of a higher psychical faculty if it can be interpreted as the outcome of the exercise of one which stands lower in the psychological scale. That's maybe true, but I don't see why. And to take another example, I altogether disagree with the view which the great K.S. Lashley expressed on behalf of the participants of the Hickson Symposium of 1948, a symposium which included the most distinguished representatives of psychology and neurology of our time. Lashley said on this occasion that, I quote, our common meeting ground is the faith that the phenomenon of behavior and of mind are ultimately describable in the concepts of the mathematical and physical sciences. This is precisely what I have explained last week that I consider to be logically untenable. These instances suffice to show that scientific authority upholds and imposes a particular system of beliefs concerning the nature of things. If you want to be a scientist, you must accept the major part of the beliefs authorized by science, though you may safely disagree with some of them. And here we meet a striking combination within science of the imposition of an immense range of authoritative pronouncements, not merely combined with a toleration for dissent in some particulars, but granting the highest degree of encouragement to such dissent. While the whole machinery of scientific institutions is engaged in suppressing evidence as unsound because it contradicts the currently accepted view about the nature of things, the same scientific authorities pay their highest homage to discoveries which deeply modify the accepted view about the nature of things. It took 12 years for the quantum theory discovered by Planck in 1900 to gain final acceptance by science. Yet by the time another 30 years had passed, Planck's position in science was approaching that hitherto accorded only to Newton. We may say that the authority of science enforces its teachings in general for the very purpose of cultivating their subversion in the particular. This attitude is an expression of the view that scientific truth is but an aspect of a reality lying beyond it. An authority which teaches to make contact with this reality submits in advance to yet unexpected manifestations of reality and encourages any dissent which aims at making new contacts with reality. The advancement of science depends both on the authoritative transmission of the currently accepted view of nature and on fostering an originality which may fundamentally modify that view. And this duality flows logically from a conception of scientific knowledge as a guide to a reality with which individual scientists are expected to make their own personal contact. Here we have the first glimpse of the structure of personal responsibility. We can recognize it by uniting two equally valid ways at looking at the scientific progress made by a series of discoveries. We may regard this progress as the growth of a body of thought occurring in the minds of people who happen to be available for realizing the next possible advance of science. 
This view would be supported by the fact that even, this, even discoveries which fundamentally refashion the scientific conception of the nature of things, such as the discovery of quantum mechanics was in 1925, can be made simultaneously as quantum mechanics his was by three different scientists at different places, so independently of each other that, at e that two of them were thought at the time to have given different and mutually incompatible solutions to the problem. Looking at this way after the event, the growth, growth of ideas seems to be predetermined. And the discoverers who achieve it seem merely to offer a suitable nutritive medium for the growth of these ideas. Yet, looking forward, before the event, the act of discovery appears highly personal and quite indeterminate. It starts with the solitary vision of a problem that is, of bits and pieces which seem to suggest that they may be clues to a hidden knowledge, that they are as yet uncomprehended particulars of a still undisclosed comprehensive entity. This solitary vision must turn into a personal obsession if any progress is to be made towards resolving its secret. And this vision, this obsession, is about something that no one can tell so that its subject is, in this sense, undefinable, indeterminate. Indeed, the process of discovery by which it will be brought to light will be recognized as, recognized as a discovery by the very fact that its result could not have been achieved by any degree of diligence in applying existing rules of inference. The great discoverer will be praised for the daring use of his imagination in crossing uncharted seas of possible thought. Yet, yet there's a link here with the alternative picture which represented the growth of scientific thought using the minds of men as a mere medium of its own proliferation. For the vision of the problem, the obsession with it, and the final leap of the mind which arrives at discovery are all filled from beginning to end with an urge towards their external objective. In these intensely personal acts, there is no trace of self-indulgence. For they all express the conviction that there is something there that must be discovered. Originality is dictated at every stage by a compelling sense of responsibility for advancing the possible growth of truth and enlarging thereby le the legitimate domain of the human mind. And this fact teaches us to avoid the false alternative between the subjective and the objective by inserting between them the conception of personal judgment exercised responsibly with a view to a reality with which we are seeking to make contact. This conception of personal knowing was implicit already in all that I have said about tacit knowing, for none of this could be called knowing but for its claim, which I endorsed, that it seeks to make contact with reality and may often succeed in doing so. The situation may be clarified further by realizing that all tacit knowing, including the process of discovery, is a personal commitment to a belief held with universal intent. Its personal pool co consists, its personal pool consists in the way we pour ourselves into it and accept its hazards. And its universal pool lies in the conception of a hidden truth which demands our service for revealing it. We readily acknowledge this seemingly paradoxical situation whenever we are confronted with human greatness. Wherever men have truly spoken in the name of truth, saying, here I stand and cannot do otherwise, 
we instantly recognize both the power of impersonal truth and the greatness of the mind upholding it. We pay our respect quite naturally both to the personal and the universal pool of commitment. The example of science has thus served us to elucidate, to elucidate for its particular case the relation between self-determination and submission to authority. The kind of responsibility which guides and justifies the originality of a scientist is, undertaking, is undertaken within a vast framework of scientific beliefs which he accepts unchallenged. You might ask whether the scientist should not be also held responsible for accepting the scientific teachings which he does not challenge. But I have shown before that we must believe in order to understand. We are therefore merely facing once more in this new context the question whether we can justify the passive acceptance of any beliefs. I think we can, I think we must. For as we have seen, the advancement of science would be impossible but for the combination of accepting the teachings of science as a whole and dissenting from them within a limited area. The confidence which he so lavishly bestows all around this limited area and which alone makes him capable of operating independently within that area, we should recognize as defining the scientist's calling. This calling, this calling is not the same for every scientist. The degree of originality any particular scientist trusts himself to possess will determine the range of subjects over which he will venture to improve on current scientific teachings and the range of teachings which he will more or less passively accept will vary correspondingly. Every scientist must try to choose a problem that is just large enough for him to master, for his faculties would not be fully utilized if he applied them to a lesser task and would be altogether wasted on a larger one. There exists then as a, a rule, there exists then a rule of responsible person, personal action in science. A rule which requires us to take neither too much nor too little for granted, so as best to assure the continuous advancement of knowledge. It is this rule that I propose to generalize in a few broad strokes into an answer to the various problems raised by this series of lectures and more particularly at the beginning of this one. Each member of a society of explorers, such as we meet in the worldwide community of scientists, pursues a different task. Any single scientist knows little of what the vast majority of other scientists are trying to do and he is neither interested in most of the results which they eventually achieve, nor is he even capable of understanding them. This condition is characteristic of a modern dynamic society throughout the whole range of its activities. It is described as pluralistic to distinguish it from a homogeneous, hierarchic society. Pluralism is said to exclude the kind of authority ruling the static societies that predominated before the French Revolution. And this is true. But the example of science has shown that this does not mean absence of authoritative control. It proves merely that the structure of authority exercised over a society of explorers is different from that to which a static society must submit. Take once more the example of science to observe this structure. The authority of science is exercised by scientific opinion, but this opinion is not present in any single person's mind, and no single person is at all competent to exercise it. 
For no scientist can judge, nor even understand, more than a tiny fraction of the whole range of natural sciences. If they yet jointly form and uphold a common scientific opinion, they do so but by what I would call the principle of overlapping neighborhoods. It is enough that each participant forming this opinion be competent to judge an area neighboring his own field, and that this neighborhood should overlap to some extent with that of other scientists applying the same standards of scientific evaluation. Such a group forms then an element that automatically expands to a general consensus of scientists. For each member of it will be also a member of other groups, and so the chain of overlapping neighborhoods will cover all sciences, ranging all the way from astronomy to medicine. This is how scientific opinion does in fact effectively compare and assess the value of contributions made all over that vast area of which no single scientist is competent to judge more than a tiny fraction. A pluralist society is generally controlled by such a mutually imposed authority. As each individual scientist submits to this kind of consensual evaluation by accepting a place in its chain of mutual appreciation, so we find more generally that each person joining one of the numberless independent activities pursued in a pluralist society joins an appropriate chain of mutual appreciations. And again, as in science, this act is never wholly passive, for each new member modifies somewhat the authority to which he submits and for which he takes no responsibility. But here we must supplement our picture if it is to cover all pluralist activities. We must admit that within the chains and networks of mutual appreciation there are differences in weight of authority. The authority of a distinguished scientist is accepted unquestioningly in respect of his own field by most scientists. What is more, the whole body of scientists exercises a similar authority over most laymen. So we find that both distinguished scientists within science and all scientists jointly within society as a whole function as intellectual leaders in respect of science. Similar conditions are found in the arts, but are more pronounced there as they frequently lead to contests between rival leaders. The arts, like the sciences, are most alive in the process of renewing themselves. But artistic originality involves, as a rule, more comprehensive changes of outlook than does originality in science. It tends to produce, therefore, sharper divisions of opinion between the innovator and who tries to establish his authority and the leaders of previously established art forms. Today, few members of cultural leadership, whether in the arts or sciences, are wealthy people living on their private incomes. And hence, intellectual life depends to a great extent on the material support given to a creative minority by the mass of uncreative citizens. Whether that support is given by private individuals or by public institutions, the support can be effective only if it is granted for the pursuit of the arts and sciences according to their own standards as established by the authority of their respective elites. Indeed, a society which does not accept cultural guidance from a set of authoritative individuals cuts itself off from any culture within its borders. Admittedly, the presence of sharply divergent schools of thought and art creates a problem but I do not think it fundamentally changes the situation. Members of the public may shift their allegiance from one leader to his rival. They may change from the camp of an academician to that of an innovator, be converted to religion or abandon their faith, drop out of any particular movement and join another. Sanity forbids that such shifts be very frequent, and even so, their scope is limited to choices between potential leaders. 
the guidance of thought is still left to a small number of individuals who have achieved acknowledged prominence in certain cultural domains. Our society may be said to possess a single culture to the extent to which our cultural leaders supplement each other, and to this extent these leaders may be said to uphold the common intellectual standards of our society, both by their own work and by guiding the appreciation of culture and inducing society to fulfill its cultural obligations. In spite of its dissonant voices, a society of explorers remains united so long as it believes that these are but reflecting discordant aspects of a realm of thought, yet hidden but accessible to discovery. And it is the same belief that makes it possible to distinguish, at least in principle, between cranks and true innovators in art and thought. Passing on in this rapid survey from cultural to political life in a pluralist society, we are faced with the puzzling fact that changes of mind in politics are accorded legal sanction in the form of self-government. That wasn't needed in science or the arts. It would almost seem that the unlimited social progress heralded by the French Revolution was entrusted to the collection of a larger number of votes rather than to acceptance of new moral truth. But this is deceptive. I have said at the opening of these talks that the pursuit of the hopes engendered by the French Revolution has achieved in the West the most humane and free societies the world has ever seen. This was not done through collecting majorities by hook or by crook. It was done by the gradual improvement of society, which, for example, in England's history can be traced back to a series of specific movements appealing to the public conscience, movements which had usually been evoked in the first place by persuasive individuals devoted to the advocacy of one particular reform. It was this moral progress of civic thought which was transmuted through the machinery of self-government into acts of social reform. These acts were the practical outcome of an intellectual process moved by its own passions and guided by its own standards. <laughs> Having asserted the necessity of authoritative traditionalism for the progress of science, we hardly need to prove this once more for the process of social improvements. Edmund Burke stands firmly vindicated, though with an important difference. Tradition has been reasserted while accepting the unlimited hopes of progress and indeed as the condition for pursuing this progress ever further. But at the point which we are moving into politics, the conception of moral responsibility meets with a challenge of a different kind. It is charged with hypocrisy. We are asked how we can say that public life is guided by moral progress when we see politics dominated by rival pressure groups jostling each other in the quest for power. Can we even preach these high ideals while tolerating a society so manifestly falling short of it? This kind of attack is familiar to us, and I have said before at the beginning that I will come back to it at my conclusion. I have dealt with it actually when I vindicated higher levels of reality against their destruction when they are identified with their particulars, forming a lower level. We must recognize here again the existence of different levels of reality. Society, as an organization of power and profit, forms one level, while its moral principles lie on a different level above it. The higher level is rooted in the lower one, for moral progress can be realized only within the medium of a society operating as an organization of power and profit. But even though morality can exist only within this medium, it cannot be accounted for in terms proper to this medium. Our sense of moral and political responsibility must conform to this logical situation. We are creatures of circumstances. 
but our moral nature does not allow us to submit altogether to circumstances. If a man accepted as immutable the circumstances which shaped him and which continue to shape him, he would surrender to total absurdity. Social, social perfectionism reacts against this consummation and thus moves in the right direction, but its aims are self-defeating. Social perfection is a contradiction in terms, for it is impossible to live in a society without taking away things that otherwise might be enjoyed by others. And it is impossible to pursue in a society any action consistently unless one has a definite task on one's own from which others are excluded. These occasions for hurting others cannot be eliminated and can only be mitigated by some system of rights and powers. To accept the framework of rights and powers which sustains man's non-moral relationships within society as a medium within which the moral improvement of society is to be pursued is to accept the calling of a social reformer. And just as each scientist must choose a problem which is neither too large for him to solve nor too small, nor too small to be worth his while, so a great reformer may call in question a large province of existing society if he feels equal to the task of improving it, while others will take the responsibility for the betterment of a much smaller area of society, perhaps an imperceptibly small one. The degree to which existing society is accepted as given will vary between greater men and lesser men. But what is accepted as given must always be predominant, even while there must be some area attained to be shaped by ourselves. I have said at the end of my first lecture that I would exemplify the attempt of a rising rationalist enlightenment so as to eliminate the clash between scientism come romanticism on the one hand and the great tide of social hopes generated by the enlightenment on the other hand. The main instrument of my revision was a vindication of tacit knowledge which limits the possibilities of critical thought. From this, I derived the conception of reality and went on to build up the image of a universe composed of successive levels of reality. This edifice extended from its base in the inanimate on which man looks down from afar to up to the spiritual firmament that overarches us all. Today, I have tried to show that human responsibility in a society of explorers lies in serving the demands of this firmament by seeking to expand, expand and amend it. This is as far as I could stabilize within the compass of these talks my conception of personal commitment with universal intent. This conception of man's actions would limit our critical self-determination for the very purpose of pursuing its unlimited aims indefinitely. If the revisionist movement recoiling today from totalitarianism were to accept some philosophy of this kind, it would do so perhaps as an act of affiliation to the great movements of reform which have so deeply improved society in western parts of the world since the French Revolution and so avoided the self-destructive tendencies of the unlimited hope spread by this revolution. And I think that our present level of consciousness, that at our present level of consciousness, even these western societies themselves can preserve their sane and successful progress only if they can achieve a coherent view of things that supports their practice. At any rate, these lectures were intended to convey this need and suggest a possible way for satisfying it. <laughs>